Hello, everyone. Welcome back. This week, we are going to have another theoretical lecture, but you'll get some practice uh, doing some coding in the exercises. Today, we're going to get into the nitty gritty of regression computations. Uh, so this will be multiple linear regression. So the first thing I want to do is remind you of what the data are and the model is for the multiple linear model. So the data consist of two parts. We have the responses, which we denote as y1 up to yn. So we'll have n responses. And then in multiple linear regression, we have multiple covariates. So in this case, we'll have p minus 1 covariates. And this represents the first covariate corresponding to the first observation. And this is the nth covariate sorry, the first covariate corresponding to the nth observation. And then here we have the p minus 1 covariate for the first observation and p minus 1 covariate for the nth observation. Now what the multiple linear model does is it relates the expected value of the response um, to a linear combination of these covariates. And here's the formula. We usually include an intercept, so there's a B0 term, and then it's going to be B1 Xi1 plus dot 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 up to Bp minus 1 Xi P minus 1 plus epsilon i. Then the assumption on the errors is that this sequence of errors E epsilon 1 up to epsilon n are independent, normally distributed with mean 0 and variance sigma squared. Now, we can put all of this information into a matrix equation. One thing I want to point out to reiterate is that our notation for the data so is lowercase yi. So that means these are numbers that you've observed and record on your computer. And our model for yi is the random variable capital yi. And you can tell it's a random variable because on the right side of the equation is another random variable, a normal. So that's just to distinguish between the, the data, lowercase y, and the model for the data, uppercase y. Now we can write this model in matrix form uh, in the following way. So we have the vector y, that's what I have here, equals x, which is this matrix here, times the vector b plus the vector epsilon. So if you just, let's just pull out y1. So y1 is going to be equal to 1 times b0 plus x11 b1 dot 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 plus x1 p minus 1 times b p minus 1. This is a typo. This should say p minus 1 here plus epsilon 1. So all of the n equations can be written out in matrix form like this. And our goal in linear regression is to generate an estimate or estimates of the things that we don't know or observe in the model. So that would be the b and the sigma squared telling us the variance of the epsilons. And at our disposal, we have the covariates, which are stored in this matrix X, which we also call the design matrix. And then we have the vector of responses. Uh, and these are data, y1 up to yn. Now the method for estimating b is least squares. And luckily there's a formula for minimizing the residual sum of squares. And it's just this matrix formula. Now if you're not familiar with where this matrix formula comes from, that's OK. Just take it as a given that this is going to be our estimate. It involves uh, matrix multiplications and inverses. Uh, if you take um, upper level uh, linear models with matrices, you will uh, figure find out where this formula comes from. So if you haven't done that, just take this as a, a formula that's given to you. Formula is x transpose x inverse x transpose y. And then there's a formula for the um, estimate of the variance as well. Now, um, there are some other things that you may want to compute. Uh, one of them are the fitted values, which is just take x multiplied by the estimate b hat. Uh, 
and also um, cal to calculate the estimated standard errors for the regression coefficients b hat, it's this formula. So what you'll notice is that this formula contains an inverse, so we're going to have to think carefully about how to uh, do the solves for that inverse. Um, but let's think about an easy case first. Oh, so I don't know if I mentioned this, but um, we're going to assume throughout the lecture that um, x has n rows and p columns, and n is bigger than p, and x is a full rank matrix. So we're going to be assuming that. What that means is that this inverse exists, x transpose x inverse exists. So we're going to be assuming throughout that that, that inverse does exist. Okay, so there are some cases where this is easy. One of them is the case where x, if x is an orthogonal matrix, which means that x transpose x is the identity, then you get this formula turns into identity matrix here, inverse of the identity is the identity, and this just becomes x transpose y. Um, so this is kind of a very special case, but it turns out in a couple of pages this is going to turn out to be useful for us. Uh, but we're going to need um, methods for doing this um, when x is not orthogonal, which is almost all the time. Um, and then we're also going to have to watch out for some pitfalls. One of them is numerically we can run into trouble if uh, this matrix x transpose x is poorly conditioned. Uh, what that means is there's a quantity called the condition number associated with a uh, matrix which is the ratio of the largest eigenvalue to the smallest eigenvalue. And if this quantity, the condition number, is large, this is bad for numerical accuracy. That means whatever uh, method you choose for um, solving these equations to end up with b hat um, could suffer from floating point inaccuracies. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Okay, I've gone back up and fixed the typo. So this should read B0 up to BP minus 1. So B is a P by 1 vector. All right, so if X transpose X is a nice matrix, meaning it's well conditioned, uh, there's not much to worry about. Pretty much any method you use um, to arrive at B hat will, see, will work pretty well numerically. However, when X transpose X is poorly conditioned, we need to worry about these floating point inaccuracies, uh, the stability of whatever solver we choose, and we should probably, if it makes sense, we should consider rescaling x. So we're going to give you some practice at doing that uh, in the exercises. Okay, so here's the problem. Um, above I wrote it as b hat equals x transpose x inverse times x transpose y. Here I'm just rewriting it as a system of linear equations that we need to solve to arrive at b hat. And this particular system of linear equations has the property that the, the matrix on the left side here, x transpose x, is a symmetric and positive definite matrix. It's pretty clear to see why it's symmetric. If you just take the transpose of x transpose x, you get x transpose x. To see that it's positive matrix, uh, positive definite, you have to compute uh, for some vector z, z transpose, x transpose, x, z, and show that that is uh, always bigger than or equal to zero. Um, and it will be, and there's kind of an easy way to see that. Uh, if not, uh, let me know if that's not obvious. Okay, so here's one method. Uh, because x transpose x is symmetric and positive definite, we can um, solve this system by first computing the Cholesky decomposition. So to remind you, the Cholesky decomposition takes a symmetric positive definite matrix, so such as our x transpose x, and computes the factorization or decomposition as matrix equals LL transpose, where L is lower triangular and therefore L transpose is upper triangular. Once you have this decomposition, the system of linear equations becomes this. And then you can solve for b hat in two steps. The first step is to solve um, 
L times a vector equals X transpose Y. So that's, this is the first step. You can see in this, in this step, V is taking the place of L transpose B. So you get V first, and then you set it equal to L transpose B, and then B hat, sorry, and you solve for B hat. Now the first solve is easy because L's lower triangular, so you can use the forward solution algorithm. And the second solve is also easy because L transpose is upper triangular, and therefore you can use the backward solve. So, like I said, this method should be fine as long as X transpose X is um, not poorly conditioned. However, it's not the most accurate method. Uh, in particular, the accuracy of this method is inversely proportional to the condition number of X transpose X. Um, whereas other methods which are more accurate are inversely proportional to the square root. So if this number is big, then the square root of it has to be uh, smaller. By the way, the condition number always has to be bigger than one. The, another issue is that if X transpose X is close to singular numerically, then the Cholesky algorithm may just fail and uh, tell you that it's not positive definite, even though mathematically it is. Um, so in sort of these tough cases where X transpose X is not well conditioned, uh, it makes sense to have another option for solving these systems. And the most commonly used other option is called the QR decomposition. This is the method that's actually used in R in the LM function. If you kind of dig into the source code, um, LM calls something called LM.fit, and then LM.fit, I think, calls uh, some sort of Fortran routine, which ends up calling um, Fortran or maybe LAPAC QR decomposition. So deep down uh, in R, when you do a multiple linear regression, it's actually using the second method. So I think it's worth spending a little time to uh, talk about what the QR decomposition is, how it's used to solve uh, the system of equations to get the regression coefficients, and a, a few methods for um, calculating the QR decomposition. Okay, so what is the QR decomposition? It factors the matrix X in the following form, X equals Q times R. Q is an orthogonal matrix, and its size is n by p, so q has the same size as x. And then r is a p by p upper triangular matrix. Uh, so this is a smaller matrix. Uh, so those are the two assumptions about um, q and r. And then if you take the system of equations, x transpose xb equals x transpose y, and rewrite it in terms of q and r, you get the following equations. R transpose Q transpose Q R B hat equals R transpose Q transpose Y. This thing becomes the identity because Q is orthogonal. So you end up getting R transpose R B hat equals R transpose Q transpose Y. And then if you multiply on the left side by the inverse of R transpose, you're left with R B hat equals Q transpose Y. So in this case, after you found the QR decomposition, um, you just have to do one backward solve. So R is upper triangular, so you can get B hat um, by doing a back solve after you've computed Q transpose Y. So this method is more numerically stable than um, the Cholesky decomposition method. As long as you have a stable method for getting um, Q trans, uh, QR. Uh, one of the re the reason for that is because basically when you're working with the Cholesky decomposition, you're kind of working with think of this as like the square of X. So if if X is a bad matrix, the square of X is going to be an even worse matrix. And here to get the QR de decomposition, you're operating directly on X. So that's why the the stability is better. Um, now, like I said, you need to be careful about uh, computing this, de this QR decomposition. So the next thing we're going to do is look at a, a few different methods for how to do that.
All right, so before we start diving into specific methods for how to compute the QR decomposition, let's just stare a little bit at these equations and think about what they mean. So here's the notation I'm going to use. We have x, which is our original design matrix n by p. I'm writing it out in terms of its columns. So what I mean here is x1 is the first column of x. xp is the last column. Likewise, for q, which is the same size as x, q1 is the first column, qp is the last one. And then here I'm writing this upper triangular matrix R in terms of all of its entries with you know dot, dot, dots to indicate uh, that there's entries between here. So the first row is R11, R12, R13, up to R1p. Second row starts with a zero, and then there's non-zeros. And then the last row is all zeros up until the last entry, R, and this should say RPP. All right, so if we multiply Q times R, and we look at what that's equal to, so if we look at the first column of X, should be the first column of Q multiplied by the 1, 1 entry of R, plus the second column of Q times the 2, 2 entry, which is 0, and then the rest of them are 0. So the first equation is the first column of x is q1 times r11. The second column of x is going to be q1 times r12 plus q2 times r22 plus nothing else because there's all zeros, so that's this. And then similarly, the third column is q1 r13 plus q2 r23 plus Q3, R3, 3. So if you stare at this, well, this is kind of like, uh, should remind you of how forward substitution works. Um, so there's a nice clear relationship uh, between X1 and Q1. So, and then we're also gonna use the property um, so we're going to use two properties to figure out what the Qs are. The first one is that the Qs are normal, so they're orthonormal. So the first thing is that they're normal, meaning that their length is 1. So in order to find Q1, we're just going to have to take x and normalize it. So R11 is going to be whatever you divide x by to normalize it, which is just square root x1 transpose x1 and then Q1 is going to be the normalized vector. Now we have this thing, and then what we have here looks kind of like a regression. So we want to regress X2 on Q1. That'll give us this. And then we're going to have some stuff left over that we need to normalize. And then same thing here, once we have Q1 and Q2, what we're going to end up doing is regressing X3 on Q1 and Q2. That'll give us R13, R23. And then the stuff that's left over is going to constitute Q3, R33. And we're just going to use normalization to get R33. Okay, so that's the basic idea. And here's how the algorithm works. So let me put this up here. Okay. So we set Q1 equal to X1 over R11. That's using this equation, where R11 is the correct normalizing factor so that Q1 has length 1. Um, and here's the math here. So Q1, Q1 transpose equals X1 over its normalization factor transpose X1 over its normalization factor, and you get this, and everything cancels out. Okay. So that takes care of Q1 and R11. Now to get um, the next step, so the next step you have to get, we have this, Q1. We have to get these three quantities, R21, Q2, and R32. Now to get, um, the plan here is we're going to regress X2 on Q1. That gives us this equation. So we do the regression, we get R12Q1 plus the residuals, E2. Uh, 
And how do you do this regression? So I wrote R21. This should say R12. How do you do the regression? Well, if there's only one thing to regress on, this is the equation for doing the regression. And um, it simplifies because Q1 transpose Q1 is just 1 because it was normalized. And therefore, you're left with Q1 transpose times X2. So this is R12. This is just the regression. And the reason we do regression is because we know that the thing that gets left over after doing the regression is going to be orthogonal to the things you regressed on. So if you remember from linear models, the residuals are orthogonal to all of the predictors. So in this regression, the predictor for x2 is q1. That gives us the regression coefficient r12, which is over here. And the residuals is just whatever's left over is going to be orthogonal to Q1. And that's really convenient for us because we're trying to write X2 in this form uh, where the stuff that's left over contains Q2, which has to be orthogonal to Q1. So the goal is we're going to build up this Q matrix where all the columns are orthogonal to each other. So regression is the right thing to do here. And once we have E2, all we have to do to get Q2 is to normalize it, um, just like we normalize um, X1 up here. And so that gives us Q2 is E2 over its normalization factor, where its normalization factor is just the length of E2. Okay, so that's, that's just regression with one covariate. And then we keep going, so I'm gonna do both three and four just so you can get the general pattern of this. So to get the third one, you regress x3 on q1 and q2. That'll give you this equation. Now, um, so you have q1, you have q2, you want to get r13, r23, these regression coefficients, and the residuals. The regression coefficients are just the regular regression formula. But now we have this situation where the stuff, this is like holds a place of x transpose x. These vectors are orthogonal to one another. So this is just the identity matrix again. And therefore you can do the regression just by multiplying q1, q2 transpose times x3. So this gives you r13 and r23. And you're left with the residual e3, um, which is just going to be x3 minus this stuff. We know that E3 has to be orthogonal to the predictors Q1 and Q2. So we just use that for Q3, but make sure it's properly normalized. So that gives us uh, R13, R23, Q3, and R33. And let me just do the fourth one. Now we regress X4 on Q1, Q2, Q3. That gives us via this equation. This gives us R14, R24, R34. We have our residuals, E4, and we just, to get Q4, we just normalize the residuals. And here's the regression co equation to get R14, R24, R34. This again is going to be an identity matrix, and therefore you can do the regression without inverting it and just multiply this by X4. Okay, so this is probably, this probably makes sense to you from a regression standpoint. Um, you've probably seen this before, but um, in a you know, slightly different equation, maybe not explained in terms of regression. Uh, this algorithm is called Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization, uh, but you could really think of it as you know, sequentially doing regressions of um, the columns of X on the previous cues. And this uses the property that the residuals are orthogonal to all of the predictors, which are the Q1 through QK. Okay, so that, that algorithm explained as such is exactly Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization. Now there is a problem with Gram-Schmidt and it's the following. At step K, it assumes that Q1 up to QK minus 1 are orthogonal. And they are orthogonal mathematically, uh, 
But as you know, numerically rounding errors can uh, accumulate. And um, if they're not orthogonal, then these rounding errors were, will accumulate. So let's look at what happens actually. So let's look at this equation where we're getting R13 and R23. Now when we compute this, we are assuming that this is the identity matrix. And it's the identity, we're assuming it's the identity matrix because Q1 and Q2 are supposed to be orthogonal to each other. So when we assume it's the identity matrix, we just ignore this part and we just do this part um, to get this answer. However, if due to rounding errors, numerical inaccuracies, Q1 and Q2 are not exactly orthogonal to one another, then this is not the right equation for regressing x3 on q1 and q2. You have to use the whole equation if q1 and q2 are not exactly orthogonal. So what happens if q1 and q2 are not exactly orthogonal? You do the wrong regression to get q3, and then q3 is not going to be orthogonal to q1 and q2 because you didn't actually uh, do regression and therefore the errors are going to start to accumulate and this becomes a numerically unstable algorithm. So even though this is an unstable algorithm, I think it's worth explaining how this works just so you can relate uh, what we're doing here to things you already know, namely multiple linear regression. And, and I think that context actually helps understand why it is numerically unstable, namely that if this thing is not exactly the identity, then this is not the right computation to do, to do the regression. Okay, so because of that numerical instability, there's something called the modified Gram-Schmidt algorithm, which is a little bit better. And uh, I'm not gonna go through this. Um, you can pause it and look at the equations if you like, um, but this is how it works. I just wrote it out for the four by four case. Basically, the idea is that um, the first step works the same way, um, but you go ahead and compute the regression coefficients for uh, R12, R13, R4 right away, and then you sort of subtract off the regression of X2 on Q1 right away and rename that Q2. Same thing for Q3 and Q4. And each time you compute the new regression coefficients, you're subtracting off uh, the regression on the new Q. Okay, so that's what that is. Feel free to look through that. And then there's a longer description in the um, Monahan book. I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about a third method for getting the QR decomposition. Because this is, you've probably seen Gram-Schmidt before in a, in a linear algebra course but you may not have seen Householder Transformations, which is another stable algorithm um, for doing the QR decomposition. So before we get into the whole algorithm for doing the QR decomposition, I want to first talk about just the what's called the Householder Transformation. And the way the Householder Transformation, it's, it's a way to construct a matrix such that when you multiply the matrix by a vector, it will eliminate all but the first entry of the vector, meaning that all but the first entry of the vector are going to be zero. And there's a very specific way that the matrix is constructed. So what we're going to end up doing is multiplying the matrix U, that's our householder matrix, by the vector X1. And the result is going to be something that looks like this. But let's go through the steps of what U has to be equal to in order that u times x1 gives you this result. And there's just a formula, it's a very specific formula. u is equal to i minus this stuff, uh, where everything should be straightforward. x1 is the vector that we're trying to eliminate entries of. Uh, so everything's x1 except for e1. e1 here I'm just defining to be the unit vector uh, with a one in the first entry and zeros otherwise. So if you do this multiplication, you get i x1, so there's an x1 here, and then you multiply this out, what you'll find is that if you do this piece times x1, 
you're going to get a x1 transpose x1 plus x1 transpose x1 square root times e1 transpose x1, which is exactly what's in the denominator. So there's a reason this was picked. It's so that it will cancel with this stuff. Uh, so that's everything written out. It cancels with this. And so you're left with x1 minus this stuff, which is over here, which is x1 minus x1. And this actually should be a minus. This, this method is actually um, invariant to whether you picked a plus or a minus here. So this is a typo, but it's actually not a, a consequential typo. So this should say minus. So you get something like this at the end. Um, so in what's to follow where I'm going to give the algorithm, we'll call u the householder matrix for x1. So it's the matrix when multiplied by x1 that eliminates all but the first entry. Okay, so this suggests the following algorithm for getting the QR decomposition. So let U1 be the householder matrix for the first column of X. So that should be exactly the same as what's above. And, um, and then we say X2, capital X2, is U1 times X. So what happens is because u1 is the householder matrix for the first column of x, the first column of the product is going to have a non-zero here and then a bunch of zeros here. And I'm already writing out these entries in the first row. And then down here is a, this is the lower n minus 1 by p minus 1 matrix. Uh, I'm just calling that a2. Okay, so this is the first step. It gives you the first row of this upper triangularization. Then we define a matrix U2, which is the same size as U1, which has a 1 in the first entry, zeros in the rest of the first row, zeros in the rest of the first column. And then down here we have the matrix B2, where B2 is a householder matrix for the first column of A2. So B2 is the same size as A2. Actually, no, B2 is square, the same number of rows as A2. And uh, it's set up, B2 is set up so that when you multiply it by A2, since it's the householder matrix for the first column of A2, you're going to get, you're going to eliminate all of the entries below the diagonal here. So if you do U2 times x2, which was u1, x1, the result looks like this. So the first row is unchanged. The second row is changed. And the rest of the entries of the second column are 0. And then you're left with a block matrix down here. And then now you can start to see the pattern. Uh, you'll set uh, in the p th in the so you keep doing this up to the last one, you get something that looks like this. And you, BP is a householder matrix for the first column of AP. And then XP is going to be the product, UP, so it's the whole thing together. So you're slowly building up XP. And by the end, if you keep doing this, you're going to get a upper triangular matrix in the top of XP. And we're going to call that R. That's the thing we're trying to get. And at the same time, you do the same multi mul matrix multiplications by Y. And we'll call that Z. And we're going to, just like we partitioned XP into R0, we're going to partition Z into Z1, Z2. So these are two vectors. And I'm calling this the new design matrix and this the new responses. The reason is that um, if you want to minimize Y minus XB, it's equivalent to pre-multiplying uh, both y and x by the orthogonal matrix up times up minus 1 all the way down to u1. So if you pre-multiply by an orthogonal matrix, you actually don't change the minimization problem. So minimizing this is equivalent to minimizing our new responses minus xp times b. And then our normal equation x transpose xb equals x transpose y becomes this. So this is our new x transpose. That's our new x. 
same B, and then this is our new X transpose, and this is our new Y. And then if you multiply this out, you'll get R transpose R B, because the zeros go away, equals R transpose Z1. And if you left multiply by the inverse of R transpose, this should, just becomes R B equals Z1. And R is upper triangular, so this is easy to solve to get uh, B hat. Okay, so there's a very specific matrix that you use for these householder transformations. And the basic strategy is you apply it to X to eliminate the first one. And then you build a householder matrix for the bottom right corner. And then slowly, so that gives you this, then you build a householder matrix for this one that'll eliminate um, another column of zeros. And then you keep going until you've got X in this form where it's upper triangular up here and then zeros below. Um, and this algorithm is a more numerically stable algorithm for getting the QRD composition. All right, so that's how you, uh, these are methods for doing the computations uh, for simple linear, linear regression, multiple linear regression when you have independent errors. Now things get more complicated when you wanna do generalized least squares. So generalized least squares is the method for estimating your regression coefficients when your errors are correlated. So the model is written in almost the same way. We still write y equals xb plus epsilon. But the difference here is epsilon is assumed to be normal, mean zero, but have covariance matrix sigma, uh, which is not necessarily equal to sigma squared times an identity matrix. So some of the off-diagonal entries of sigma may be non-zero, indicating that you have dependence between different observations. So this is very common. Um, for example, if you've seen random effects models where you have like a subject effect and you have multiple observations per subject, um, you have correlation between the multiple observations from the same subject. Uh, you also, if you've taken like time series, the models often assume that um, adjacent observations in time are more correlated than observations that are far apart in time. And the same thing works for spatial data. Observations that are close together are more correlated than observations that are far apart. So when you have this kind of model, the optimal method for estimating the regression coefficients is not X transpose X inverse times X transpose Y. It's the following, X transpose sigma inverse X, all inverse times X transpose sigma inverse Y. Um, now, in many cases, the number of observations is much larger than the number of covariates. So there are many solves in here, but in this situation, the most computationally demanding solves are ones that look like this. So sigma times V equals XJ, which is this, these solves look like that. And not the ones we were concerned about before, which are the P by P solve. So this is a P by P solve, whereas this is an N by N solve. And if N is much bigger than P, then this is gonna be the computationally demanding one. So for generalized least squares, we are generally more concerned with the sigma inverse times a vector operations. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about two methods for how you do this. The, one will, the first one will be very familiar, and then the second one is probably gonna be new, so we'll spend a bit more time talking about that. So the first one is, I'm um, calling it a direct method, um, and that's just compute the Cholesky decomposition. So you have sigma, this is an N by N matrix, Sigma is automatically symmetric and positive definite because it's a covariance matrix and co all covariance matrices have that property. So it can be factored with Cholesky decomposition with the caveat of there may be numerical inaccuracies and this may, be, may fail, but let's assume it doesn't. Um, so once you have this, uh, we just do, we have to do sigma inverse times X. Um, the way we, well, 
we have to do this whole computation. So the way we do this is we do uh, this lower solve LV time equals X. And here X is not a vector, it's an N by P matrix. But all this means is you do this lower triangular solve P times once for each column of X. So we solve this for V. So we're going to get V equals L inverse times X. And um, actually, we don't need to do this one. Um, so this is a typo, actually. Oh, wait, no, it's not. This is correct. Um, so we do L, L inverse V equals X. And so LV equals X. And then we also solve for Z in LZ equals Y. And then if you have V equals L inverse X, then if you do the uh, transposes, then what ends up happening is X transpose sigma inverse X is V transpose V. And then X transpose sigma inverse Y becomes V transpose Z. Okay. So once you have this, uh, then we'll use whatever method we used before. So this just looks like the problem we had before uh, for regular least squares. Uh, use a good method to get B hat, such as the QR decomposition. So the hard part is, is this part here. So if that works, it works, just do it. However, in, in some cases, uh, this is either going to be too unstable or more often it's going to be too slow because N is very large and we can't afford to um, compute this Cholesky factorization. So the th second thing I'm going to talk about are indirect methods. And what indirect, what I mean by indirect method is that we have an iterative solver for getting things like this. So we want to do solves like this because in our equation we have sigma inverse x. So we want to solve for w and sigma w equals x, where w is, um, and then put them together here. And once we've done these solves, then the equation just becomes x transpose w inverse w transpose y. Let me scroll up here so you can see why that's true. So once you've computed sigma w equals sigma inverse x, then you get w here and a w transpose here. So this becomes x transpose w inverse equals x transpose y. And once you get it to this form, um, then you, you know, use a good method to get b hat, such as qr. So what do I mean by an iterative solver? So here's how, basically how they work. Uh, we want to solve, so I'm talking more generally here, not necessarily about sigma. Um, but if you have a matrix A, and a vector b and want to solve ax equals b. An iterative solver is basically a guess and check method. So you start with an initial guess, say x equals b. You check it by doing a times your guess, x1, minus what a times x is supposed to equal. Call that your residual. And then based on what this residual looks like, you pick a new uh, direction to search in, and you update x by doing x2 is x1 plus your update. And then you check the next one. So you do a x2 minus what it's supposed to equal, which is b, call that r2. Pick a new search vector based on that. This is v2. And then you keep going, so on and so forth. And assuming everything goes well and you've picked smart search vectors, you stop when this thing gets sufficiently small. So when R is sufficiently small, that means that AX minus B is small, and therefore AX is close to B, which is the thing you were trying to get. And there's many different types of iterative solvers. They're basically all the same, except they... Uh, differ in how they pick 
um, how to search for the next one. So how you update, so you have your guess, how do you update it based on the results of the previous one. And for symmetric positive definite matrices A, which is the one we care about in this case, uh, the two most popular, or you can think of this as one method of different varieties, are what's called the conjugate gradient method or the preconditioned conjugate gradient method. So we're going to look at uh, those two methods. All right, so here's the conjugate gradient algorithm. Um, this is taken from, uh, there's a great book called um, Numerical Optimization by Nosedell and Wright. This is algorithm 5.2. So here's the problem. You want to solve AX equals B. So you have A and you have B. You want to solve for X for symmetric positive definite A. And uh, here's the algorithm. So basically I'm giving you the algorithm without much insight into why these particular choices are made. Um, if you want to learn more about this, I think um, like a numerical analysis course would be good or an optimization course would be good. Um, we don't have time to get into the nitty-gritty nitty detail of why uh, this is. I can give you some heuristics, but uh, so let's take a look. So you start with your initial guess. Uh, this could very well be just picking x0 equals 0. You form your residual, a x0 minus b. And then our search direction is going to be represented by P. And our first search direction is just in the negative direction of the residuals. OK. So um, here's the update step XK plus 1 equals XK plus alpha K PK. So we're moving in the direction of our search vector PK. And the amount we move is alpha K and that's given by this quantity. It's a ratio. So it involves the size of the residual and this thing here. Um, interestingly about conjugate gradient is you can compute the residual. Uh, so normally you'd compute the residual by taking this a difference like this, but you can actually update it in this way because you know what it's going to be. And I'm not showing you why, but that's true for this. And so you know what the residual is, and in each iteration, you check whether the residual is small by looking at something like this. So this is like the size of the residual. If it's smaller than some tolerance, so make, make this like 10 to the minus 8 or something like that, 10 to the minus 12, then you return your solution xk plus 1. If not, you have to pick a new search direction and the new search direction is um, you take the original search direction, you scale it, and you move it in the direction of the residuals. And the scaling factor is the following. Okay, so it sounds complicated, and we're not going into the details of why this is the algorithm and why this is a good algorithm. Uh, but it's actually very simple to implement. Um, so you can easily code this up and assuming you've made no mistakes, you should be able to solve some systems of equations. Okay, so why would we do something like this? Um, this is mostly for computational speed and, and somewhat for accuracy. Um, the Cholesky decomposition, to compute it, it takes roughly n cubed over three floating point operations. So, um, People often talk about the computational co complexity of an operation. The Cholesky decomposition is an order n cubed operation. So it depends on n through the cube of n. So if you increase it, if you, if you double it, it becomes eight times harder. Now if you look at the computational operations involved in the conjugate gradient, the most expensive one is multiplying your original matrix times the search vector. Matrix multiplication is takes n squared floating point operations. Um, all the rest of the stuff, so you've already computed this here, so you don't have to do it again. 
you have like inner products here and those are order n so those are much um, easier operations so basically in each step you have to do a matrix multiplication which is order n squared so um, the cost of solving for x using conjugate gradient is roughly n squared times the number of iterations it takes to converge so you can see clearly that if it converges in fewer than n over 3 iterations, this algorithm is going to be preferable to taking the Cholesky decomposition. Um, and oftentimes you can, with um, the modification we're going to see in the next step, it can converge much faster than that. On top of that, this algorithm is especially useful if A has certain properties that make matrix multiplication easier. So this, if, so if, since this is the most expensive operation in the conjugate gradient algorithm, if this can go faster than n squared operations, then you can start to see some real advantages um, for uh, using it over doing the Cholesky decomposition. So when can this go faster? Um, if A is sparse, meaning that most of the elements are zero, then basically you don't have to do the operations that you know are going to result in zeros, and you can skip them. And therefore, you can use less computation to um, compute this matrix vector product. Another situation is if A has some sort of exploitable form, and I'm just giving one example here. So for example, if A is equal to a diagonal, times ZZ transpose, where Z will have to have N rows, but if it has M columns, where M is much less, so say M is 10, and N is 1,000, then to do this matrix multiplication, well, just multiplying diagonal matrix times this is easy. Um, basically, you take the, each diagonal and do element-wise multiplication with this. And then instead of forming this n by n matrix you basically do this matrix multiplication in two steps so you first, first multiply z transpose times pk and then multiply z by this this is a lot cheaper when than doing z the whole thing zz transpose times pk when m is much less than n so that's just one example uh, well two examples now where um, doing this matrix multiplication can be much faster than n squared operations. And in those situations in particular, these iterative solvers are especially useful. Um, the other advantage is um, these particular matrices also allow us to avoid storing the entire n by n matrix A. So often not just computing time, but memory limitations can be a bottleneck. Okay, so that's conjugate gradient algorithm, and you can see if the problem has certain properties, it can be um, there could be major advantages to using it. Um, unfortunately, um, conjugate gradient, so we're down here, does not converge quickly for many problems, which means that the number of iterations will often be very high. Um, but there is a solution. We can do much better than conjugate gradient algorithm if we have a good guess for the inverse of A. So we don't need to know uh, exactly the inverse of A. As long as we have a good guess for it, uh, we can speed up the conjugate gradient algorithm significantly. And the way we do that is, is with the what's called the preconditioned conjugate gradient algorithm. This matrix M that we're using as our approximation for the inverse of A is called the preconditioner. And here's how the algorithm works. It's going to be basically the same, except there's uh, one extra step. So we take an initial guess, which is our approximate inverse times B. We form residuals, and we keep track of something called Y, which is going to be M times the residuals. And our search direction is, our first search direction is minus y. So this part should look the same. This part should look the same. Residuals should look the same. 
but this will differ in our updates for the search direction. So we first compute y k plus 1 equals m times the residuals. m, again, is our preconditioner. And then our update is going to be a scaling of our previous search direction minus this y vector. And this is the scaling. OK, so that's the preconditioned conjugate gradient algorithm. It's not really any more complicated. Again, with this, you could code it up yourself very easily, as long as you're careful. Uh, one thing to worry about when you're coding this up is um, you don't actually want to store uh, R1, R2, R3, all the way up to R number of iterations. So you want to overwrite the Rs, but you have to be careful that you don't um, overwrite them in the wrong order. So for example, at this step where you're computing the scaling factor, um, you're using both rk plus 1 and yk plus 1 in the same computation where you're using rk and yk. So when you code this up, you should overwrite previous r's and y's and x's for that matter. Um, but you should make sure you're doing it in the right order so that you can compute things like this without making a mistake. So what you don't want to do is uh, update r and then compute this and divide by this and get 1 every time. So you don't want to get 1 every time. Um, okay, so that's just a side note in terms of practical implementation. So again, m is called the preconditioner matrix. If you look um, actually in Nosedal and Wright, they actually define M to be an approximation for A. So this is just a difference of convention of what you're calling M. Here I'm calling M an approximation for the inverse. If you take this convention, uh, this equation, which is uh, this one here, is replaced by this solve. Okay, so just be careful about how M is defined when you look at different uh, definitions of the algorithm. And then the last thing I want to talk about is what makes a good preconditioner. So can you just guess what the inverse is going to be? Um, so, and what makes a, a preconditioner a good preconditioner? Now, if you pick M, if you're good at finding this matrix in that M is a close to the inverse of A, this will lead to fast convergence in the sense that your algorithm will converge um, in a small number of iterations. However, there's a trade-off generally that the, the better the approximation of m to a inverse, the harder it is to compute m times a vector. Uh, if you recall, the whole reason is that we don't know how to compute a inverse times a vector. It's too hard of a problem, so we're trying to get around that. So you kind of have to balance picking an M for which it's easy to do this multiplication and for which M is a decent approximation to A inverse. So whenever you're building a preconditioner, you're always balancing uh, these two things. So for example, we could write A in, as a block matrix, um, so like this. So each matrix A i, j is a submatrix, not a specific entry. And we could pick the preconditioner to be a block diagonal matrix, where on each diagonal block, you just take the inverse of the diagonal block of A. Now, M is not equal to the inverse of A. If you just multiply these together, you won't get the identity matrix. But M has First of all, m is going to be easy to multiply by a vector because basically you just have to take the inverse of a small part of a and multiply that by the first part of the vector. Inverse of the next part of a, multiply that by the next part of the vector and store it. Um, so it's this is a case where m is easy to compute and to multiply by a vector, but it's not equal to a inverse. Um, but this is the kind of trade-off you have to make when constructing uh, preconditioners. So here the balance is going to be, so if you made uh, the blocks uh, bigger, you get 
better approximation to the inverse, but larger blocks uh, mean slower computation. So that's the kind of trade-off we're thinking about. Okay, so that is a conjugate gradient and preconditioned conjugate gradient. These are iterative solvers. Let me just remind you what we're trying to do. We're trying to solve this equation. And why do we care about that? Because in the generalized least squares, we have uh, this kind of thing, sigma inverse times x, which requires a solve. And um, it can be computationally advantageous to avoid this direct method and use an indirect method, such as an iterative solver, to get these uh, equations. Okay, so that's it for today. We did uh, QR decomposition for um, least squares computations, and then we did... Um, direct and indirect solvers for doing generalized least squares computations.